Well, hello again, everyone, and welcome to the 75th episode of the Cotton Companion Podcast. It's been a busy few weeks in cotton since we last visited with you, and boy, do we have a lot of news to catch up on. This is Jim Stedman, Senior Editor of Cotton Grower, and as always, I'm joined by Cotton Grower Editor Frank Giles. Howdy, Frank. How are you doing? Hey, Jim. How's it going? Uh, the 75th episode, I think that is like the diamond anniversary in uh in the in the scheme of things so uh that's a lot of them down the road here well if some of our listeners want to shower us with diamonds i'm sure you know that would <laughs> you know that would that would be acceptable but uh but at the same time i'd, I'd much prefer to see the baseball diamonds back in in use no it's doubt cool. about that anyway we we do have a long list of news items to share today uh but before we get started we're going to start things off with a short message from our sponsor phytogen Phytogen is pleased to sponsor the Cotton Companion, bringing you the latest news to help you thrive all season long. All right. Thanks, as always, to the folks at Phytogen for sponsoring the Cotton Companion podcast. And before Frank and I get started, we're going to turn things over to our colleague Robin Sickberg for a custom content interview with Dr. Sean Butler. And Sean is the Phytogen Cotton Development Specialist in East Georgia. Hello, I'm Robin Sipberg, custom content editor for Meister Media Worldwide, publisher of Cotton Grower Magazine. I'm here today with Dr. Sean Butler, Phytogen Cotton Development Specialist in East Georgia. Welcome to the program, Sean. Thanks for having me, Robin. Well, the cotton season is well underway all across the cotton belt. Um, I know you're in Georgia, so what, what have you seen so far this season and, and how the crop is progressing in your area? Yeah, sure. So over in East Georgia, again, we, we got a little bit later start this year, uh, partially due to the market, also due to a little bit of a, a cold snap we had late. Uh, but once once we got seeds into the furrow, things flew out of the ground. Uh, most of our phytogen cottons always had that excellent emergence. We've always seen really good early season vigor. If you tie those particular traits with the near perfect environment we've had, both from a rainfall and temperature standpoint, and, and our cotton's just growing like a happy little weed this year. So Environment's been great. Emergence and vigor has been great, and our cotton's really starting to shape up uh, to look like look like a good one for 2020. That's great. Um, are there any particular agronomic issues that growers should be looking out for, in your opinion? One thing that we we kind of thought might potentially happen because of our mild winter didn't really have a hard frost or or really any freezing temperatures is insect and nematode pressure. Uh, we've seen spider mites and tarnished plant bugs both. Uh, pop up a little bit sooner this year than we normally would. So having to address address those with our insecticide programs uh, and our scouting efforts, pay a little more p attention to that. Uh, additionally, in, in crop that is not phytogen, and we're seeing a lot of root knot, uh, root knot nematode infested cotton, as well as fusarium falling in uh, with phytogens, root knot breeding traits has not been an issue for our particular growers. Uh, but with them able to overwinter last last year, have seen a lot of pressure from, from root knot nematode as well. I know you've mentioned to me that you use a drone to help find problems in the field. Would you like to share some more about that? One thing I carry around is my drone. I'll pull it around when I'm making my, my viewpoints and trying to look at the cotton crop in progress, let it fly over, get a bird's eye view. It has a, a non-biased opinion. It just sees what it sees and brings that back down. Uh, then I can take that information and, and more direct my scouting efforts to places that look really good or really bad in the field. But again, it's also non-biased, so I can take my own subjective opinions tied to that non-biased source of data coming from the drone and really understand both crop progress and potentially how do we need to manage these varieties going forward. Yeah, it sounds like a really useful tool and, and gives you good perspective over the whole field. Well, we have to wrap up because we're about out of time, but I want to thank you so much, Sean, for being on the program. And as always, growers can get more information at www.phytogen.com. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me, Robin. Thank you, Robin, and thank you, Sean, for that interview. Uh, and Frank, I guess rather than trying to uh, to dissect one or two hot news items like we normally do, I think the best thing we can do uh, at this point to get started is just jump in with both feet on this long list of news items uh, that have occurred over the past three weeks. Why don't you go ahead and kick things off, and we can just kind of discuss them as we go. That sounds good. Let's talk about crop progress um, from the July 13 uh, USDA report. 
we have about 63% of acres now in bloom. That's up 16% from last week. Bowl set is coming along and it's reported in 18% of the crop now, up 5% from last week. And the crop's looking pretty good. 44% is rated good to fair, I mean good to excellent, 30% fair and 26% poor to very poor. Yeah, and when, and when you go back and look at those numbers, particularly when you get into the, uh, the poor, very poor category, uh, the thing that really jumps out at you is, is right now, 31% of the crop in Texas falls into that rating. 20% uh, in Missouri, uh, which I know got a late start on planting this year, and, and the same with South Carolina, I think is sitting at 17%. So, uh, you know, we're kind of watching those numbers on a week-to-week -week basis, uh, and, and quite honestly, this week was one where things slipped just a little bit, uh, but not much, not much change when you get up into the higher categories. Yeah, and, and you know, in our conversations with our consultants for the crop scan report, mm -hmm. uh, the guys I'm talking to in Georgia and Carolina, North Carolina, uh, crop looks pretty good so far there. Um, I think it's getting a little bit dry in North Carolina, so they could they could use some rain. But uh, I'm hearing pretty good reports otherwise. Yeah, I think when you when you look at Texas as a as a whole, uh, well, particularly over on the coastal bend and uh, into central Texas. Uh, those crops are looking great. Uh, when you get yep. up into the, the high plains, the south, you know, the south plains and the upper high plains, uh, anything that, that was that, that was a dry land crop is essentially gone at this point. Uh, there were just some comments that I heard from growers last week on it, and uh, so they're just they're trying to hang on to what they have at this point with uh, with the irrigated acres uh, in the midst of this uh, this intense heat wave that they're experiencing. Good deal. Well, let's move on to some other news now. Late last month, after our last podcast had aired, uh, Bayer announced its $10.9 billion, that's with a B, Roundup Settlement. And they also announced a $400 million mass tort agreement to settle the dicamba drift litigation uh, that alleged damage to crops. The agreement will resolve multiple cases that claim uh, soybean growers and certain producers of other crops suffered dicamba drift damage from 2015 to 2020. Uh, the litigation will cover other costs like attorney and administrative fees. Claimants uh, will be required to provide proof of damage to crop yields and evidence that it was due to dicamba drift in order to collect uh, funds. The claims process is expected to begin after this year's uh, harvest uh, has been completed. Uh, details and timing issues are still being worked out. We'll certainly keep you abreast of those as we, as we learn information. We've talked a lot about the Ninth Circuit Courts Dicamba labels for Extendamax, Fexapan, and Ingenia uh, being vacated in early June. Uh, the court did allow EPA's decision to stand to allow the use of uh, existing dicamba stops until the end of the month. Um, the EPA is currently reviewing new registration for Extend the Max for the 2021 season and beyond. BASF says it will also continue to pursue EPA re-registration for Ingenia for the coming seasons. So a lot still going on there. I think we're probably going to go into a little bit of a lull between all the Ninth Circuit craziness uh, to the re-registration process that will happen later in the year, but, uh, but a lot, lot yet to cover in this story. Definitely, and I think from our perspective, a lull is probably a good thing right now. Um, I will put a plug in at this point is, even though there's not much news happening, we're still going to keep covering and, uh, and reporting on this, uh, on this topic. Uh, we have started a new e-newsletter uh, called Protect the tech, uh, where we will be uh, be sending that out every other week to uh, to our e newsletter subscribers, uh, just kind of keeping them abreast on things that are that are continuing to happen. Uh, certainly, I think as we move into the re registration process, the likelihood of more legal action is 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 probably there. Uh, plus, we still don't know what's going to happen with the the lawsuit that's currently sitting with the Ninth Circuit Court regarding the enlist technologies. But either way. Uh, we'll certainly be staying on top of it 
and uh, and try to bring uh, you all of our listeners uh, the latest news on this as as quickly as we can. Yeah, one interesting tidbit it just came across the wire. Um, an Iowa State weed scientist is reporting that he is seeing the most extensive uh, dicamba drift injury that he's ever seen uh, this year. So that's not good news. Uh, that's not good news. He attributes it to early planning and some environmental conditions as well. But uh, we're not hearing that necessarily in cotton uh, country, but that certainly probably could complicate things uh, as all this gets underway. Yeah, uh, yeah, because EPA obviously doesn't look just at cotton acres; it looks at all acres. So, uh, yep. yeah, we'll keep our our fingers crossed. This process goes goes smoothly. Yep. Uh, on June thirtieth, USDA announced its planted acreage report and gave us a number for cotton at twelve point two million acres. That's down eleven percent from last year. The total includes twelve million uh, acres of upland cotton down 11% from last year and 195,000 acres of Pima down 15%. USDA's March 31st prospective planning report projected a 13.7 million acre crop for 2020. And that would have only been down 1% from last year, but uh, I guess a lot happened between May and the planting time uh, uh, to knock those acres down by 11%. 16 of the 17 cotton producing states uh, showed an acreage decrease for this year. Only Kansas reported an in increase from 175,000 acres to 195,000 acres this year. Uh, looking at some regional areas, southeastern cotton acres were down 17.4% to 2.45 million acres or 515,000 fewer acres than last year. Mid-South acres were down 21.7% uh, to an estimated 1.88 million acres, a drop of uh, 520,000 acres from last year. In the South Southwest, estimated acres are down 5.5% to 7.44 million acres. Uh, again, Kansas was the only area that saw some acreage increase Overall, the region is down 427,000 acres from 2019. Western Upland and Pima acres combined are estimated at 405,000 uh, acres, down 88,700 acres from last year. The report also showed that 96% of all cotton planted in the U.S. this year included biotech traits for insects and or herbicide resistance which actually is down 2% from last year, but still a very popular technology. Yeah, it's, it's one of the reasons why the, uh, uh, some of the, the recent legal rulings that in, impact cotton probably did per, perhaps just a little bit more than it might with some other crops. And, and I will tell you, and we'll get into this later in the podcast with our, with our, inter, our guest interview, um, that 12.2 million acre number that USDA put out actually surprised a lot of people that, that were they were expecting the number to be down from, from the March 31st number, but they weren't quite expecting it to drop that far. Uh, but I think that's at this point, when you consider the conditions that are going on out in the country and then the, the, the state of the crop at this point in various conditions around uh, the cotton belt, that's probably a pretty safe number to look at uh, from that 12.2. And, and we'll talk about that and the impact on the, how, it, how it's impacting the markets at this point uh, later in the podcast. Look forward to hearing that. Um, with all the COVID craziness going on out there, the National Cotton Council has decided to take the Beltwide Cotton Conferences online this year. Uh, the, the meeting will be held uh, January 5th through the 7th. And that meeting originally was going to be held in New Orleans, but it's all going to be virtual this year. The uh, virtual platform will include three days of live stream individual reports and panel discussions from the technical sections, along with poster presentations and seminars to, to design to provide attendees with information they need to help producers make key cotton production and marketing decisions going forward. Uh, more information on the virtual Beltwide will be coming and we'll, we'll report this as they become available. 
Okay, that's it's it's interesting that this seems to be a trend right now, and and I commend the National Cotton Council for for going ahead and making a decision on this meeting because uh, you know as as Frank sitting in Florida and, and me sitting here uh, in the Greater Memphis area, we're all everybody's seen spikes in the cases in COVID cases at this point, but there is a I guess uh, the Center for Exhibition Re Industry Research. Uh, I, I found this yesterday, Frank. It, there's, they did a survey uh, on uh, tracking the impact that COVID-19 is having on, on the exhibition industry and, and events. And they're basically saying that 81% of any business to business uh, exhibition organizers have already canceled their events and 41% are already switching to virtual events. So uh, I think this is a trend that, that we're going to, uh, we're going to see continue as certainly as we move through the rest of this year and, and certainly into early next year. Uh, I know the Milan No-Till Field Day, which we'll talk about here in a minute or two, uh, has, gone, has gone virtual. And uh, I'm going to be uh, checking in on that next Thursday, uh, the 23rd, to see exactly how, how they pulled that one off. Yep, uh, it's definitely a trend here. I live in Orlando and the Orange County Convention Center is, you know, a major host of big trade shows and conferences. And if you go to their website, they have a list of all the conferences that is, that has either been rescheduled or canceled. And, and right. it's kind of shocking to see the number and the impact that uh, that's having on these events. Uh, and speaking of Milan no field, uh, no till field day, that's a, that's hard to get out. Uh, they're going virtual too uh, on July 23rd. They're going to be featuring 16 different uh, virtual tours co covering topics ranging from cotton to soybean to beef to hemp in an online format. Each tour, which should take about an hour to complete, includes multiple sessions and present presenters in this online format. You can get details on the educational section by clicking on research tours on the Milan No-Till Field Day website. Uh, the site also has a free re event registration and you can get updates on Milan's No-Till Field Day Facebook page. Uh, the sessions will remain accessible on demand and growers can get uh, pesticide certification and CEU credits uh, throughout the end of the year uh, from that online content. And Jim, I tell you, it, I, it definitely will be cooler attending the virtual Milan no-till field day than the real no-till field day. I, I have to tell you, one of the hottest days I ever recall was attending that field day uh, back in the early 2000s. It has, uh, it has traditionally fallen on the hottest day of the year in the mid south with uh you know with a full complement of, of tropical uh you know tropical heat and humidity um i give them credit i went ahead and registered for the for the field day online several weeks ago and uh and suddenly my mail the other day shows a package shows up from uh from the field day with my with my official no-till field day cap and uh and a few other little goodies uh pad and and pin to, uh, I guess, to wear the cap while I'm sitting here watching the presentations and certainly the, use the others to take notes. So uh, my appreciation to the folks at, uh, at Milan for, for making that happen. And uh, I look forward, as you said, to sitting here in the comfort of my little uh, air conditioned office to, uh, to, to take, take part and, and follow and see what the presentations are this year. Well, that is a nice touch uh, from them. We'll, we'll want to see a picture of you with the hat on. Uh, as you're covering the event there, so uh, we may maybe we'll put publish that in the magazine in the next issue. We may have to, yeah. In terms of, <laughs> of how we're adjust how we're adjusting to covering the industry, yeah. It, exactly. Uh, we've got a couple business related items. Uh, the first is Winfield United will add cotton to its Armor brand of seed offerings for the 2021 growing season, as it moves its proprietary cotton seed from cropland to the Armour seed portfolio. According to the company, the transition from cropland to Armour will complete complement both Armour's soybean seed and cropland's corn seed, giving regional growers uh, top-of-the-line cotton, corn, and soybean varieties to consider 
in their rotations. This also comes on the heel of Corteva's announcement that it has purchased the J.G. Boswell Company's ownership interest in the Phytogen Seed Company, uh, which was established as a joint venture between the two companies to focus on the U.S. cotton seed industry. So a little bit of cotton seed movement here. Definitely, little, uh, you know, even even though the crops in the ground and growing, you know the business the business moves on. So it it's uh, uh, the, the Corteva announcement is not surprising. I think that's just basically uh, you know taking care of, of the final ownership details. Obviously, uh, the the move of cropland, uh, Winfield's move of cropland over to Armor, uh, I think it's going to be interesting. We'll uh, we'll see. Armor's is, Armor's a pretty well known brand here in the mid south. So it'll. Uh, It'll certainly be a boost for for that brand and and uh, see how growers you know what growers do and uh, when they start looking at varieties. Good deal. Speaking of phytogen, phytogen's best yielder members recently donated program points totaling more than fourteen thousand dollars to the National FFA organization, Give the Gift of Blue program, providing approximately a hundred and eighty of the blue FFA jackets along with matching coat and scarves. So those kids are gonna be looking sharp with those new coats. Uh, the National FFA organization has more than 700,000 members in 8,612 8, chapters in all 50 states, Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. Uh, only those, of those, only about half own their jacket. So that's a really nice uh, donation by them uh, to get those kids dressed out and looking good. And, and I agree with you. If, if nothing else, since we were talking about virtual meetings, I think the FFA organization, their national conference is also going virtual. So if uh, it'll be, it'll be good to have all those kids uh, uh, and young leaders dressed in their, uh, in their blue jackets, sitting, sitting in, uh, in front of their computers for their zoom meeting. So it'll, I'm sure that will, it will look impressive. Yep, it's going to be a, a blue out, as they say. Yes, definitely. Good deal. Uh, we've got a, our friend Richie Seaton, the executive director of the Georgia Cotton Council, is retiring uh, the beginning of August. And he has been there for 26 years, been a, been a long time servant to Georgia Cotton, and certainly will be missed. Um, Taylor Sills, current uh, director of public affairs for the commission, will succeed. Uh, Seton as the new executive director. During Seton's tenure, he reestablished the commission's office and staff and ushered in the organization's research, promotion, and education programs to newer and higher levels to help to meet the needs of Georgia's increasing cotton acreage. Uh, so, great guy. We'll miss him. Uh, guy did get to meet uh, Taylor at the Cotton Council's annual meeting. Uh, he seems like a good young man, so I think he'll do a, do a good job. It's, a, it's an important organization for, those, uh, for the growers in Georgia. And, and again, Richie's done a, a tremendous job over the years of, uh, of building an organization into, uh, into the little powerhouse that it is. So uh, congratulations, Richie. We hope you enjoy your retirement. Indeed, indeed. Now moving on to some Plains Cotton Growers news. Uh, congratulations to Brent Nelson of Sudan, Texas, who was elected president of the Plain Cotton Growers, Inc. for the 2021 season uh, during, the during the organization's most recent quarterly board of directors meeting. Joined, joining Nelson on the officer team for the 42-county cotton producer organization are Martin Stoner of Lockney, who was elected vice president, and Travis Myers of O'Donnell, who was elected secretary treasurer. Immediate past president Stacy Smith of New Home serves as the chairman of the board. So we got a little bit of movement over there with the uh, organization of the Plains Cotton Growers. Yeah, uh, a good organization and uh, we've been fortunate enough. I think one of the, one of the benefits of, uh, if you can find a benefit of, of everyone sheltering at home and working from home is that uh, Plains Cotton Grower always, cotton growers, traditionally have uh, an every other week uh, update meeting in their offices on Friday mornings. And uh, one of the benefits of this is uh, they're doing those meetings by Zoom, which allows me and a lot of other people in the industry scattered out in wide geographies to actually join in 
uh, and listen to see uh, see what, they, what sort of get the latest news and information on what's going on with uh, with cotton on that market. So uh, it's a great organization, uh, and congratulations again to these new officers and, and directors. I guess Frank, that's that's probably enough news to discuss today. It's probably it's certainly more than we than we usually throw into uh, into these podcasts and. So I'm just going to say to put sort of the icing on the cake for this episode, uh, we're going to join to visit again with our good friend and, and noted cotton economist, Dr. O.A. Cleveland. Uh, obviously, between the recent acreage reports and the supply demand reports, the cotton market has moved into some interesting territory here in the last few days, and we're going to let him explain it all to us right now. As mentioned, we're going back to the cotton market in this episode's market segment. We took some time to focus on a few other topics of interest in past episodes, but now the market's getting interesting again, and it's time to bring back one of our favorites, Dr. O.A. Cleveland, He's Professor Emeritus of Agricultural Economics at Mississippi State University, to explain exactly what's going on right now. O.A., the last time we visited with you was back in March, just as things were beginning to lock down for everybody. So uh, welcome back to the Cotton Companion, and, and how are you doing? Thanks so much. I'm doing fine. I'm sitting here rather amused at saying expert, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody's got to be in, the, in this. Yeah, this somebody. <laughs> I, I, just jumping in on this, over the, over the last couple of months, and I guess almost depending on the week, the cotton market has looked, it's looked awful, it's looked promising, it's looked stagnant, uh, and sometimes all three at the same time. Uh, but over the past two weeks, we've, we finally have seen our acreage report that, that tells we've got 12.2 million acres of cotton and a somewhat promising supply demand report that we saw last week. Um, how are these reports factoring into the market right now? What's, what has the market done and, and, and what kind of a promise do we have at, at this point? Well, great questions, Jim. Going into the, uh, supply demand report, uh, most of us, but not all, felt like the plan plannings were going to be higher than the 12.2 million acres that you mentioned. In fact, I just totally and absolutely blew it. I had it at 13.2 million acres. Uh, some awful smart folks had it at 12.7, and that was a half a million bale miss, but first time in a long time, growers did not follow the scenario, we're going to plant regardless, just plant for the insurance. Mm -hmm. On the hills, of, and the market began to come up. In fact, uh, the market reached a four-month high. Very impressive, very happy. Almost got to 65 cents. It got close enough to kiss it and feel the kiss. Uh, the supply-demand report came out somewhat optimistic, uh, reading between some very tight lines, somewhat pe pessimistic, but it did finally give us an idea. It, it gave us numbers that we could view as optimistic. And basically the day the, the report came out uh, on that Friday, it, uh, the market performed reasonably well, mm -hmm. but on Monday and Tuesday, uh, following that, the market has been down. It's not uh, been able to maintain that, but uh, we're still within reach of where we were and we can still get back to the 65 cent level with the possibility, uh, certainly in my opinion, of going as high as 66. Technically, the market says it wants to go to 66 cents. I, I'm not just real pleased. I think we've got uh, we've got an awful lot of cotton out here. Of course, USDA told us we had what a million and a half bales on this coming crop, less than what they thought in, in the prior month. Mm -hmm. And I think once we buy into the fact that 12.2 million acres are planted, then that does tell us that our crop will be somewhere around 17 million bales. Of course, the USDA estimate is 17.5 million bales. Uh, that's a midpoint. They could go higher, but uh, most of us tend to feel because of the problems in Texas specifically uh, that the crop is going to be somewhere like 17 to, mm -hmm. to 16 and a half million bales. I don't think we should write off the fact yet that this market could be as low as this crop could be as low as 16 million bales. It's pretty low, but we can't write that off just yet. And that would get the market going again. But as we look at these prices, and again, prices have 
tried to get to 65 cents, just came from a, a hair without getting there on that March to 66 cents. And to say again, I think it still wants to try to do that. But in the meantime, we come back and look at other points in this world supply demand report, and we go outside the United States. We saw that uh, some countries that we talk about all the time, but they don't get a lot of uh, excitement. Uh, Bangladesh is, is one that comes to mind. Uh, we see that uh, imports into Bangladesh, USDA lowered those. Well, that's U.S. cotton going into Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. So that's an export situation. Pakistan, they lowered their imports. That's U.S. cotton. Indonesia, Malaysia, they lowered all those imports. That's all U.S. cotton, uh, basically. And that's a reason or one of the two reasons they lowered exports of U.S. cotton from, what, 16 million bales down to 15 million bales. One, historically, and USDA has said this out loud and in public, anytime they lower the crop size as they did this time, they will also lower exports. The two kind of go hand in glove. But also another reason to lower the exports, as I indicated, was and, and it was the, um, the, the, the importation of cotton by these cotton consuming countries. And that to me was the real highlight of the world supply demand report showing that U.S. importers were actually decreasing their importation of cotton. And that's a problem mm -hmm. for us. And that's why long term, I'm a little bit concerned about prices that we're going to have to go back down and deal with the, uh, the high fifties at least. Uh, so I'm sitting here thinking in terms of uh, 57, 58 cents being a low up to p potentially 66 cents being a high. Got a couple of buddies that will go up to 67, 68 cents, but when they do that, they will tell you, well, we're not really, we don't really think that's going to happen, but we can see it. Oh yeah, I can see it. But 66 cents is the best chance high that I can find. And I'm not so, I do still think we want to try to hit 65 cents, but I'm not going to sit back and wait on it. We're going to probably use some of the option market before we wait on 65 cents. Yeah, well, that was that was one of the things that I was going to ask you about, considering all the factors, not just in the U.S., but around the world. Uh, when you look at, at, at the reports that are both bullish and a little bit, you know, and bearish, uh, with everything else, are we really kind of sitting where we where we should be sitting price wise right now? Yes, I think price wise, we are very much where we should be with with the thing you're not going to want me to hear a grower or hear to say a growers. Well, we may be just a tad high mm -hmm. in my opinion. Uh, you know, we're looking at a hundred hundred plus million bale carryover, and we're still at sixty five cents. We've not had a 65 cent price with a hundred million bale carryover before. So that's why I think we're a little bit high. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the U.S. crop is going to be lower than we anticipated. Uh, Mother Nature tells us that she could really create havoc in West Texas. West Texas, it's set up. A more abandonment is probably coming. So as you lower this U.S. crop and the fight for quality, the demand for quality may be able to keep this market up in this area. But again, I'm thinking longer term, we need to do puts. I uh, will come back and say, as usual, there'll be a very good demand for, uh, for, for premium quality cotton. And if I can make one more comment before I forget it, I forget everything nowadays. Uh, there, the, 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 the physical price of cotton, the market price for cash cotton has not gone up with the futures market. And that's, that spells a typically spells a bit of a, a problem for, for, for the prices in, in, the, in the oncoming month, the oncoming season. Well, I've heard over the last couple of weeks, I've heard the term uh, demand destruction kicked around quite a bit by, by some economists. How far away are we kind of from, from seeing a, a proper encouraging upturn return in, in demand, or, or are we still looking at some possible shifts in manufacturing as we sort our way through this? Uh, this situation. What uh, what what's your perspective on that? I was hoping not to have to hear that question. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough tough question. We're still fighting, and we'll continue to fight the the demand destruction vis-a-vis -vis coronavirus. People aren't working. 
you know, we got it. The, the U.S. consumer customer got a big boost from uh, from from the president and the and the and Congress, the Senate is uh, with the with, with the CARES Act, the funds that were pumped into the economy. Those funds are getting ready to run out at the end of July. Some of them will stretch into August, but those funds are getting ready to run out. And we're going to be left with a large consumer base without funds fairly soon. So consequently, I think it is imperative, and I'm not trying to get step on the toes of the macro economist, but I think it's going to be imperative to put money in the hands of the consumer again. Mm -hmm. uh, the consumer drives this engine, this, this engine, here, this economic engine here in the United States. It's consumer driven 100%. No one's going to question that. And the consumer has to have money in their pocket. I know I don't go to stores anymore, but I'm old and fat and ugly and have other diseases too. But uh, I, I do buy a reasonable amount online, and I would have sworn I would never do that. I was going to always support my local uh, uh, mercantile association, but I'm buying stuff online. I see boxes around town, people's houses. A lot of people buying online, but again, we're going to run out of the consumer's going to run out of cash pretty quick. Yeah. Until we can, until we get another CARES Act, until we can move further down the road, uh, our demand is still questionable. And cotton markets require demand if they're going to move higher. It's one thing to have a reduction in supply and a small supply. That will give us a boost, but it will fail. It will stop there. We have to have a continuous demand if we're going to get up into the 70s or if we're going to get up, in, if we get to the 70s, to get to the mid-70s and into the 80s. I do not see that coming for at least a year. Okay. Uh, so I think we're stuck here probably around 65 cents, and that's pretty much close to the top. Okay. Sounds good. OA, as always, uh, these visits with you are, are always entertaining and, and enlightening. Uh, I do want to tell you, I have been told by some of our listeners that they really enjoy your segments uh, on the show. So, uh, so there's your there's your 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 little pat on the back for for today. And 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 obviously, again, thanks again for taking time to join us. My pleasure, my my pleasure. As we sit around the house during the coronavirus, you're like anything, but I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> good luck to you. Thank you so much. Maybe we can get a good price. Let's hope. For Let's it. hope so. Why don't you work on that? Okay. All right. Thank All you. right. Thank, thank you. you Jim. And here's Thanks the rest. Of, here's the rest of this episode of the Cotton Companion. As always, our thanks to uh, to Dr. Cleveland for his time and, and expertise. That pretty much takes care of this episode of the Cotton Companion podcast. Thanks again to Dr. O. A. Cleveland for joining us. And thanks for the folks at Phytogen for sponsoring uh, the podcast. Thanks to our listeners, too, uh, for joining us. And tell your farmer friends about us and where to find us. And they can do it three easy ways. Uh, number one, by going to cottongrower.com and adding a uh, front slash and the word companion. So it reads cottongrower.com slash companion by subscribing to our channel on iTunes or wherever you find your podcast these days, or you can sign up for our weekly e-newsletter, the Cotton Grower e-news, that will hit your mailbox every Tuesday morning. You can do that by going to www.cottongrower.com slash subscribe. And you can also find us on social media. We are at Cotton Grower Mag on Twitter. And you can find us on Facebook by searching Cotton Grower Magazine. Our latest issue of the May-June issue of Cotton Grower will be comfortably in your hands by now. And we will be starting our work on the August-September issue real soon. So we're busy summertime here. It never lets up, does it? Uh, this podcast is produced by Tyler Hatch. He's our colleague and editing wizard at Meister Media Worldwide in lovely summerish. Willoughby, Ohio. Uh, my name is Jim Stedman. I'll be back with you in a few weeks for the next episode of The Cotton Companion. For now, on behalf of my own Cotton Companion, Frank Giles, we wish you all the best and stay safe. Phytogen thanks you for listening to this edition of The Cotton Companion. 
To learn how you can thrive with Phytogen, go to Phytogen.com.